I don't believe Anthony Gaspipe Castle needs any introduction. Most people know who he is and that he once held the underboss position in the Lucchese crime family. His infamy is mostly based on his treacherous and callous personality. To say that he was a psychopath is an understatement. But keep in mind, what's unacceptable by society's standards is normal by the standards of the street. Today, I want to discuss why Gaspipe was never used as a witness and had his cooperation agreement revoked. In the late 80s, Gaspipe received word that both Vicar Musso and himself were going to be indicted for the Windows case. By May of 1990, rather than stick around and be arrested, both Lucchese bosses decided to land it. Vic headed to Scranton, Pennsylvania, and Gaspipe to Mount Olive in Bud Lake, New Jersey. During their time spent as fugitives, they grew beards and mustaches in an effort to disguise themselves and were able to run the family through their subordinates. The purpose of going into hiding is if enough time goes by, you can learn what evidence is against you. And in some instances, your attorney can work out a better plea if you turn yourself in. Time is in your favor. The more time that goes by, the better. My co-defendant and I only lasted less than two months. Definitely not enough time. Vic's time was up on July 29, 1991, when he was arrested at a mall in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Gaspipe, on the other hand, would remain a fugitive until January 19, 1993 after his arrest at the Mount Olive location. As a result, Gaspipe was placed at the MCC, and that's where his wheels began turning to devise a plan from how to get from under the mountain of legal problems that he faced. He came up with different methods to escape, which was his first plan. One plan included escaping on horseback with Mikey DeSantis, where they would gallop away from the prison like they were in the Wild West. But none of those plans came to fruition. With escaping off the table, he decided to have a relative approach the FBI. The news of Gaspipe wanting to cooperate came as a surprise to law enforcement. Nevertheless, they gladly spoke with him, but offered him basically nothing in return, just a promise of a 5K letter, which is a letter from the U.S. attorney that's presented to a sentencing judge detailing his cooperation. This letter could convince a judge to sentence the defendant below his guideline range. However, the judge ultimately makes the decision as to what sentence he or she wants to hand out. As part of his cooperation agreement, Gaspipe was obligated to give complete, truthful, accurate information and testimony, and he couldn't commit or attempt to commit any further crimes. As you could imagine, not an easy task for somebody like Gaspipe. Keep in mind, he was used to the power of manipulation, not only to get what he wanted, but he was able to convince people to act on what he wanted accomplished. In his narcissistic mind, he believed he could do this with the FBI. What he failed to realize is the FBI wrote the book on manipulation. Nonetheless, the deal he worked out with the government would soon begin to crumble and was basically over before it began. On March 1st, 1994, Gaspipe traveled to federal court under the guise of having to give handwriting samples. In reality, he was appearing before Judge Eugene Nickerson for a closed hearing. He was pleading guilty to 72 counts, including murder, attempted murder, and conspiracy to murder, among other crimes. Instead of returning to the MCC, he was placed aboard a jet and he was flown to Biggs Army Airfield at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. He was then transferred to Latuna Federal Prison. Once in the prison, he was housed in what was known as the Valachi Suite, which the prison created by conjoining two cells before Joe Valachi's arrival in 1968. Here's a picture of Joe Valachi sitting at a desk in the suite. In fact, it was at that same desk that he wrote his memoirs, the Valachi Papers. Besides the desk, Gaspipe had a television, a radio, a refrigerator, microwave, a hot plate for cooking, table and chairs, and a sofa. His bed was located in the adjoining cell. The FBI and the U.S. attorneys would visit him at the suite and debrief him. Out on the street, the telltale sign that Gaspipe was cooperating was when he fired his lawyer, Mike Rosen. Any defense lawyer, especially one whose clients include members of organized crime, cannot defend someone who decides to cooperate. If he or she did, they'd be ostracized. Naturally, when news of gas pipe disposing his lawyer reached the ears of the mob, the official word went out on the street that he flipped. In that life, when something of that nature occurs, the first thing on everybody's mind is, what did I do with him? Understandably, the concern is any crimes committed is expected to be exposed. The first disconnect with the government came from Gaspipe divulging certain information. Some of the things he had to say contradicted two other government cooperators, Al Diaco and Sammy Gravano. When Gravano began cooperating, he denied any involvement with the drug business. 
which would be in his 302s. Reports prepared by the FBI based on what he told them. 302s are essential for defense attorneys in fighting cases. According to Gaspipe, he was heavily involved in the drug business, and Gravano was one of his best customers. That statement regarding Gravano caused major problems and concerns for the government. At the time, Gravano testified in over a dozen cases, including John Gotti's. If they were to use Gaspipe as a witness, the defense attorneys would learn that he discredited Gravano, and all of the cases that Gravano testified in would be in jeopardy. Gaspipe also claimed that the ARCO wasn't being 100% truthful. Although one of the statements that he made about the ARCO, he was wrong about. He claimed that the incident that took place at the Kimberley Hotel on September 18, 1991, was a figment of the ARCO's imagination due to paranoia. At the time of the incident, I was in prison. But years later, I heard from several people in the Lucchese family that the ARCO absolutely was marked for death. And it was Vic and Gaspipe who wanted him hit. So Gaspipe's statements caused a big problem. The FBI and the government not only hate being wrong, but they despise being embarrassed. During one of the interviews with Gaspipe, he admitted to conspiring to kill a federal prosecutor, which obviously didn't go over big. They learned of a murder he committed against a boat captain's son, who he believed to be a potential informant. He told the agents that he shot the guy and buried him alive. The FBI conducted several psychological tests on him, which concluded him to be a psychopath. The question remains, with everything Gaspipe told them and everything they already knew about him, did they really need to have him tested? They knew exactly what he was from day one. Let's not forget, the FBI profiles people for a living. On May 15, 1996, Gaspipe, in his one and only time testifying, did so by appearing before a U.S. Senate subcommittee in Washington, D.C. And to everyone's surprise, including the senators, he spoke not only respectfully, but conducted himself very well. At the time, he was being housed in the Witness Protection Unit in Otisville, a medium security federal prison. While at the facility, Gaspipe bribed guards and civilian workers to smuggle him in contraband, such as drugs, alcohol, food, among other items. He also got into an altercation where he assaulted Big Sal Michiata, a former Colombo. Michiata, who towered over Gaspipe, got the better of him during the fight. That incident was reported to the guards who documented it. And of course, the fight and the smuggling were conveyed to the FBI and the U.S. attorneys. By this time, they came to the conclusion that they were not using gas pipe as a witness. However, they purposely didn't notify him about that. Instead, they strung him along in order to get more information out of him. In 1997, U.S. Attorney George Stamubulitis filed an affidavit stating that Gaspipe was an unreliable witness and that the U.S. Attorney's Office was rescinding his cooperation agreement. On October 8, 1997, the government revoked Gaspipe's agreement, which they felt he breached. On October 9, 1997, the very next day, Gaspipe was removed from the Witness Protection Unit in Otisville. In 1998, Gaspipe, void of a 5K letter, was sentenced to 455 years. He attempted to appeal on the grounds that the government reneged on their deal. Additionally, he stated that his defense lawyer, one picked by the U.S. attorney, did not properly advise him or represent him. This is a control tactic that the government uses. They'll pick your defense lawyer because they're picking the lawyer they can control, one who will go along and do things to their liking. Consequently, all his appeals were denied. In December 2020, Anthony Gaspipe Castle died of respiratory failure from pandemic-related symptoms. The following is an excerpt of a 60 Minutes interview with Gaspipe conducted by Ed Bradley. During the interview, Gaspipe displays his personality while explaining the murder of Jimmy Heidel. In September of 1986, Heidel was part of a hit team that attempted to kill Gaspipe. They were unsuccessful. He speaks about after having Heidel abducted and taken to him. I took him to a place that I had prearranged. You know, somebody's house that I could use. Sat him down. I wanted to know why I was shot and who else was involved, and who, you know, gave the order to shoot me. After extracting that information from Heidel, he described what took place next. I didn't shoot him in the head. That was somebody's house. You make a mess. No, I shot him a couple of times. I didn't torture the kid. I didn't do anything like that. I just shot him a couple of times. The kid died. Ed Bradley interjected. What's a couple? Gaspipe responded. More than a couple. Really, I don't know the exact amount. Maybe I shot him 10 times, 12 times. Ed Bradley said, maybe 15 even. Smiling, Gaspipe responded, it could have been 15. Ed Bradley wanted to know why. 
Gaspipe told him, that's the hatred I had for him. I wanted to beat him with the gun after it was empty. What Gaspipe explained during this interview is the same kind of information that he explained to the FBI. The government's reasoning for not using him was they felt he wasn't credible, coupled with the trouble that he got into in prison and all the crimes he was involved in. However, they were fully aware of most of these crimes. The ones they weren't aware of, like conspiring to kill a federal prosecutor, were not looked upon as him being honest. But isn't that what the stipulation in his agreement expected of him? For him to give complete, accurate information? When he first offered to cooperate, the FBI didn't tell him, you're out of your mind, look at all the crimes you committed. No, they met with him. And after he pled guilty to everything, they placed him on a jet and put him in a Valachi suite beneath the surface. They did all this because of Gaspipe's position within the Lucchese family. He had information that they wanted access to, information that they used to make a lot of cases. Everything went south when he mentioned things that contradicted their other witnesses. The bottom line is the government used Gaspipe. They knew his history. Let's not forget, Al Diaco filled them in on that. So rather than jeopardize those cases, they labeled him a compulsive liar, threw him out of the witness protection unit, and sat back and watched him get sentenced to 455 years. He quickly went from playing on the same team to being treated like an enemy. One of the reasons they used to rip up his agreement was his committing crimes by smuggling contraband into the witness protection unit. Meanwhile, they were fully aware that other cooperating witnesses were doing the exact same thing. The truth of the matter is, Al Diaco and Sammy Gravano testified in cases that ended with convictions of bosses. And here was Gaspipe putting their credibility into question. And that's the real reason the government turned on him. And instead of denying his appeal, the court should hold the government to honor their agreements. A legal agreement is defined as a mutual agreement. I'll end this with something Gaspipe told an FBI agent. You people are far more threatening and dangerous to the citizens of New York than the five organized crime families.